stand up. From a defabricated solar powered garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, how to avoid awkward moments at the dinner party after you mistakenly deep fry a turkey vulture. Ew. And now, the podcast host who has no worries for such things because he prefers his turkey vulture oven baked. Pete Dominic! Thank you very much, Pete Co, for always telling the truth about me and my preferences. Great to have you all joining me today here on the podcast. It is the last week of April that... April 24th is when I am posting this episode for. I've got Mara Quint, as I normally do, on Monday's great conversation with Mara. Brilliant insights about Twitter and politics and very funny jokes, as always. I think you'll really like that conversation. It begins at about 32 minutes after this amazing, enlightening, informative, and I think entertaining opening segment. But I've got a whole bunch of other things that I want to play for you here on the Monday show. Some Really good sound clips and just a bit of our conversation from last Thursday night's hangout where it was some really interesting, thought-provoking commentary from you, listeners and subscribers who joined me for the hangout. So I've got that as well. I hope that you had a great weekend. I certainly did. Got a lot done. I really worked the last three days quite a bit. Had some fun as well. But by work, I mean, I was outside getting after it, folks. Picking up compost and mulch free. If you go to the town mulch dump, where in my town of Clarkstown, New York, they take all of the leaves in the autumn and they compost them through a an interesting process at the town dump. And then it turns into amazing compost for your garden lawn or however you want to use it so i got as much of that as i could and i got a whole bunch of mulch did that in the beautiful weather that we had here in the northeast over the weekend saturday i was in new york city warming up the audience for hbo's last week tonight great episode last night i hope you didn't miss it after that i met up with a really good friend of mine from high school from growing up my whole life my closest friend alex we had a couple drinks on saturday night got back outside on sunday caught up with mara and the big news in my house is that our 18 year old daughter ava has committed to ithaca college made the announcement yesterday and we are really very very excited and terrified about how we're going to be able to pay for it but we will figure that out so please subscribe to this podcast so you can help support my daughter's education because that's where a certainly a good percentage of your prescription is now subscription i'm gonna need a prescription is now going to go so sign up now at standupwithpete.com how's that for a plug Become a paid subscriber, get to hear from these brilliant guests each and every day, helping us figure out how to understand the news, understand our lives, and everything that's important to discuss here every day with the best, smartest people I can find, make friends, join our community, and now help pay for my first daughter, and some of you have been with me since she was a little girl, for her college. Thank you very much. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. You guys are the very, very best. I cannot do it without you. Oh, and thank you to everybody who reached out over my conversation with Amy Chase, who joined me on Friday. That sh- uh, show posted on Friday. That was part of my Gen Z series. A lot of really nice things that listeners reached out and said. Really nice things, including my friend Kim Nyborg up in Iowa. We love Kim, and she wrote a tweet. She said, what a phenomenal human Amy is. My favorite was at the end, the rebel piece that she talked about. I love that so much. I went back and listened three times and even played it for my husband. I highly recommend the whole episode, but just sure that part. Kayleen emailed me and said, oh, Pete, what a wonderful interview. I truly enjoyed this conversation with Amy. 
Um, James V out in Arizona wrote, Pete, you did it again. The conversation with Amy Chase was among the best ever. What an amazing individual, an amazing life she's earned and been awarded at such a young age. Thank you so much for continuing to broaden your listenership horizons. Please enjoy the week and get those hands in the dirt. James, I did. Thank you very much for all of your comments. Just a few there I wanted to share with you. You can email me standupwithpete at gmail.com. All right, by now you probably know the news, but just a quick headlines. U.S. Embassy staff were evacuated from Sudan as fighting continues there. I listened to all the Sunday shows while I was out with the the dirt and the mulch, and all of them mentioned this story. American staff at the U.S. Embassy in Sudan's capital being evacuated. It was a pretty dramatic operation, apparently. President Biden is going to enact new rules for carbon capture in power plants, according to President Biden's EPA said it slated to announce those measures requiring gas fire power plants to capture carbon from their smoke smokestack. Sources said that yesterday or over the weekend. Oh, sad news here. You probably did you hear about this bed, bath and beyond America's retail giant of the 90s and 2000s has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on Sunday after a series of last-ditch efforts to keep the company above water failed. The company said it will liquidate all its assets before going out of business. So head over to your local bed and bath and pick up some low, low low-priced home goods. By the way, I used to call it Bed Bath & Beyond. We were walking into it one day, my wife and I, and uh, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I like Bed Bath & Beyond. And she says, "Uh, who says the beyond? Like, what do you mean? She says, nobody says that. Everybody just says bed and bath. So I guess everybody just says uh, bankruptcy now. But if anybody wants to settle that 10-year-old argument, I'd love to hear from you. Do you say the beyond or not? In other news, a lot of people got shot in America over the weekend, which is something I think I could pretty much say every Monday here on the podcast news section. And Fox News actually apologized for everything they did wrong. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I'm kidding, actually, but that didn't let the late show at CBS and Stephen Colbert stop them when they mocked up, edited up a great montage. Here it is. Fox News is out a whole lot of money, but they're not telling their viewers any of that. And they don't have to because the settlement does not force them to own up to the damage they did to our country or apologize on their network. So we feel the same way. So we've decided to make them apologize on our network. Before we go tonight, we want to say we're sorry to Dominion and to the American people. We here at Fox News lied to you about the 2020 election repeatedly and consistently. We admit that we are guilty of amplifying those voices. Insane people like this guy. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell. A guy like this is given a platform. Because we want to make sure when you're watching Fox News. And will make you dumber. My original, my slippers are back in stock. Please take us off television before we allow these crooks to turn our country into dumps. Big, massive dumps. <laughs> oh, yeah, they use my favorite clip. Our part now. There they go. All right, that's... Colbert and The Late Show with a hilarious edit as if Fox News would ever apologize for all of their lies. Okay, well, I guess the big news over the weekend was that the Supreme Court, yeah, that one, temporarily has preserved abortion pill access. The bar, (laughs) the bar is so low. Sorry for laughing. It's terrible. But the Supreme Court on Friday upheld nationwide access to the abortion pill, Mifepristone, at least for the time being. In its first major weigh-in since overturning Roe v. Wade, the court blocked a prior decision by this stupid Texas judge uh, that would have overturned the FDA's approval of the drug. So, Ali Velshi had the president and CEO of the Center for Reproductive Rights, the great Nancy Northup, on his show over the weekend, and he asked her for her reaction. I thought this was really good. Uh, Not not detailed at all. Uh, We just know from two of the justices, because they said they dissented, Alito and and Thomas. Uh, What's your sense, if you if you were to read the tea leaves, what's going on? Because this is going to likely end up back at the Supreme Court. Well, I've given up long ago trying to read the tea leaves of this Supreme Court. But what your viewers should just recognize is that this is a very different world from the world of overturning Roe versus Wade, which is a constitutional decision. Wrong headed. But that was a constitutional case. This is about how a specific 
expert agency, the Food and Drug Administration, which is given great deference and should be for its scientific expertise. This is just about administrative law and the rules around administrative law and whether or not when an agency here, the FDA makes a decision, you know, is it arbitrary and capricious? That's what they have to show. And there's no way this was arbitrary and capricious 23 years ago. They had the science, they had the evidence. And then that's only gotten stronger in the 23 years since, as 5 million women have used medication abortion, as more studies has come out, as the World Health Organization has found it to be an essential drug. So it's a very different world from overturning Roe versus Wade. And any judge that looks at this as they should under the law of administrative law, it has no merit. There you go. Nancy Northup of the Center for Reproductive Rights. I should probably try to get her on this show. The Supreme Court United States stayed the order which banned the abortion drug Mifepristone. There will not be a federal ban. Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito were the ones to dissent, unsurprisingly, in what apparently sounded more like political arguments, according to one interpretation of Alito's dissent than legal arguments. Quote, it just generally reads like an old guy who watches a lot of Fox News and is ranting about how he had to pay for a blue check mark," said Leah Lippman, who's a law professor at the University of Michigan. And Lawrence Tribe tweeted something that I said re- right here at the beginning. I'm just looking at it. He said the U.S. Supreme Court has become so grave a threat to liberty, equality, dignity and science and the rule of law that we breathe a sigh of relief and celebrate when it manages to do the obviously right thing. How sad is that? Of course, in reference to their ruling on Supreme Court's ruling on the abortion pill. Okay, well, that was a big story, the biggest story, I think, that broke over the weekend. So I wanted to share some analysis and reaction with you on that. Of course, I focused a lot on the threat that Christian nationalism poses here in the United States of America. Of course, it's on the march. If you're not sure what that term is, then you probably haven't listened to many episodes of this show because I've been talking about it with experts for the past few years here, and we got some really good evidence. I couldn't believe this. I hadn't heard this, and then I thought, well, wait, this can't be really a thing. But of course, politicians are trying to placate Christian nationalists because they are Christian nationalists. And in Texas, the state Senate there passed a bill that will require the Ten Commandments in every classroom. But Now, it it probably won't become state law, and if it does, it'll go to the Supreme Court, and they're probably not going to like this for uh, some pretty obvious reasons regarding the Constitution. But if they did allow for it, the unintended consequence would be that you can post pretty much anything else that you want up as well. I mean, you could have satanic verses, you could have uh, Muslim prayers. I'm not equating the two, of course. I'm just saying that the unintended consequence is that these Republican politicians, of course, who I'm referring to, the Christian nationalist, fascist, white supremacists that I'm referring to, probably wouldn't want Muslim prayers or satanic prayers or any other religion's prayers being posted everywhere. But that is a potential possibility. Now, here is that Texas senator. His name is Bill King, he introduced the bill earlier this month. Again, it did pass the Texas Senate. What Senate Bill 1550 does is simply says that that in every public school uh, classroom in the state of Texas, there shall be posted a copy of the Ten Commandments. It prescribes the exact same language for the Ten Commandments, which is on our own capital grounds and which has been approved by the Texas and the U.S. Supreme Courts. And also, if you go to the U.S. Supreme Court, you'll also notice when you walk in as an establishment of its role in law and liberty, the Ten Commandments is posted above the justices and on the doors. This is American tradition. If schools uh, in Texas uh, do not have it in their funding to do that, they can't accept private dollars for this. And uh, with that, I would move suspension. Secretary will call the roll. Secretary will call the roll. All right. Well, that's some scary stuff, of course. Uh, Ryan Bort at Rolling Stone writes, The United States was founded in the separation of church and state. It's in the Constitution and everything. The Republican Party has long been working to dismantle this principle, sometimes by gesturing toward Christian nationalism and sometimes in the case of the Texas State Senate, by trying to write it into law. 
The legislative body approved a bill on Thursday that wouldn't just permit the state's public schools to display the Ten Commandments. It would require them to do so and to do so prominently. The Senate Bill 1515 holds that a public elementary or secondary school shall display in a conspicuous place in each classroom of the school a durable poster or framed copy of the Ten Commandments. The copy of the Judeo-Christian principles to live by must be, quote, legible to a person with average vision from anywhere in the classroom. Ryan Bork goes on to write a little context here. This isn't the first time that conservative legislatures have tried to force the Ten Commandments into school, which has been in light of the 1980 Supreme Court ruling that struck down Kentucky law requiring schools to display the Ten Commandments. The Supreme Court ruled that that law violated the Lemon Test, which was established as a result of this 1971 ruling in the Lemon versus Kurtzman case. The three-part test has since been used to determine whether a law violates the part of the Constitution laying out the separation of church and state. But the Supreme Court overruled the Lemon Test last year when it ruled in favor of this Washington football coach that I talked to you about here with Eric Siegel a couple of times. Of course, that case, he was fired after leading students in the prayer on the field. Well, anyway, this crazy Texas senator cited that ruling as he touted his Senate bill, which will, quote, remind students across Texas the importance of the fundamental foundation of America. So that is what is happening in Texas. We'll see what happens with the Texas State House of Representatives. But their crazy lieutenant governor there, Dan Patrick, said bringing the Ten Commandments in prayer back to our, our public schools will enable our students to become better Texans. <laughs> okay all right well there you go it's happening obvious it's out in the open they are saying exactly what they want to do and where they want to do it and how they want to do it and it's up to us to prevent them from doing it so get out to your local town hall support people at the state level in your state house so you don't become texas and those Texans listening, we're here supporting you, and you can always come stay with us. All right, now I want to play for you a couple of people who are fighting back. First, this is uh, Justin Jones. Of course, he's one of the Tennessee legislators who was expelled and then reinstated after he became world famous. And Republicans stepped on their dicks in Tennessee and also raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for these guys. Anyway, this guy is a, a Christian, so I want to make sure people don't think I'm painting all Christians equally. Christian nationalist is a certain type that I think we are hearing from more and more in this country who have been emboldened to remake America into their uh, perfect Christian nation, uh, Gilead, if you will. Not quite, but close, I think. So... Here is Justin Jones using religion to prove the hypocrisy of Republicans across the country. Again, Kim Nyborg tweeted this, and I saw it. You should all be following her. She's so very good on Twitter. If you're still over there on Twitter, at K-V-O-N-Y-Borg. Anyway, here he is, Justin Jones. I think this is just a, a brilliant one-minute, 15-second rant. This bill is trying to put the words in God we trust on our state seal. But everything we've done this session has been an affront to what God calls us to do. I believe that this proposal to put in God we trust on our state seal is using the, God, using the Lord's name in vain. I think of Isaiah 10 that says, woe to those who pass unjust laws that hurt the poor and rob them of their rights. I think of Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly? I think of, Lord, um, I think of Luke 4, 18, where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, leads to the captives. If we look at the word of God, there's over 2,000 scriptures that talk about how we should treat the poor and vulnerable. And we're not doing that in this body. So we're going to use God's name. We're going to put on a seal to pat ourselves on the back. But we're, we're doing everything against God, God's will, and, and who he called us to care for, which is the orphan, which is the widow, which are the vulnerable of our state, which is the blood of these children who are killed in Nashville at Covenant Elementary School, crying out to us. And so you want to put in God we trust on the state seal. But I believe that God would call us to do more than just to do a slogan. God would call us to do justice. God would call us to do righteousness. God would call us to care for the least of these in our state. Out of order. Out of order. Justin Jones in Tennessee. Great, great clip there. And here's another guy fighting the Christian fascist, Christian nationalist. He's a retired U.S. Navy officer who has declared war on the religious fanatics in Florida who are in Florida 
and across the nation who are flooding school boards with demands to ban books, arguing in front of one board that they're engaging in religious fascism. According to a report from the Daily Beast, Michael Daly, a 54-year-old guy uh, named Wes Rexrode, appeared at a school board hearing in Florida's Martin County, where he gave members of the board supporters of book bans a piece of his mind. This is a guy who was deployed on an aircraft carrier. He was a naval commander at one point, and, well, I'll let him speak for himself at that school board hearing. I'm a parent to a middle school student here in Martin County former senior reactor operator at the nuclear power plant up on Hutchinson Island and commander, United States Navy, retired. You know, Ray Ray Bradbury, the author of Fahrenheit 451, had a great quote. You don't have to burn books to destroy your culture. You just have to get people to stop reading them. You know, on September 11, 2001, I was on board USS Theodore Roosevelt when religious fanatics who wouldn't even let women be educated Blue planes into the World Trade Center and my Pentagon. Spent the last decade of my naval career fighting religious fascism abroad. Never thought I'd have to fight it right here in the United States of America. I grew up in rural South Carolina, and books got me out of the trailer parks. My parents trusted those educators and the librarians to let me read what I needed to read. Spent 21 years in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, where I'm Ohio and Rick Over. That a questioning attitude was the key to success in the nuclear power program. I want my son exposed to different ideas and different viewpoints so that he can learn to think critically and not be force fed somebody else's opinion. We've all been exposed to different opinions. It makes us better, it makes us stronger. Diversity has made me stronger. I didn't sacrifice 21 years of my life to stand idly by for religious fanatics and other fanatics try to impose fascism on my country. I urge you to think about what a book ban needs and use transparency. I don't need anyone else telling my son what he can and cannot read. I'm very perfectly capable of determining that for myself. Thanks for your time, for listening. I urge you to remember the Little Rock Nine. Thank you. Shout out to the Little Rock Nine. Okay, so I thought that was awesome, and I think that's two examples of folks fighting fascism, Christian nationalism every day. So I wanted to play those for you as well and as a reaction to everything that's happening across the country and that we're going to be seeing playing out in this very ugly presidential race where it's going to be Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, according to a whole bunch of really smart people, but anything can happen. It's still a long way away. 562 days until November 5th, 2012. And apparently, by the way, the polling is really low for both Joe Biden and obviously Donald Trump. 44% of Republicans don't want Trump to run for re-election, according to this new poll. 70% of Americans, including 44% of Republicans, do not want President Trump to make a White House run in 2024. And a whopping 70% think Biden shouldn't run again days before he's set to announce his reelection bid. So there's that as well. All right. Now I just want to play for you before we get to my conversation with Mara Quint. I want to play for you a little bit of our conversation from last Thursday night's hangout because there were a couple of issues that came up that got discussed and I thought this is really good. Bill Boyle was hanging out with us and so I asked him about Elon Musk and his rocket blowing up. Talk more a little bit about uh, that with Mara Quint uh, coming up. Uh, Everybody loved uh, what Bill had to say here. You'll hear a couple of other voices as well because there was like 50 people there but here it is. I thought this was really great from Bill on Thursday night. Do you have anything that you want to say about Twitter, Elon Musk's rocket ship, or anything else? Well, uh, so I posted a thing about how um, apparently these jackasses didn't bother to build the sort of launch pad you're supposed to build, like even the fucking Russians built at Baikonur, where you don't have the pad explode out into the protected salt marsh that your rocket launcher is right near. And if you look at my Twitter feed, you can see like this car just getting crushed by... Huge chunks of concrete. If you if you watch the launch, the one, the main thing you can see from a distance, look into the ocean as the rocket is launching. Enormous like chunks of concrete are being ejected out into the 
out into the ocean. It, you know, the sort of, what was it? The unexpected disassembly. What was that term they used? Like that was, I thought cheeky and fine because, you know, they're trying to do an experimental rocket, but everything else about it is like such obvious shite. I mean, they're, they're basically destroying the wetland that that thing is on. It's such a classic uh, Musk thing to ultimately just not give a shit about the sort of tertiary outcomes of the things he does. And by the way, you know, like the biggest unexpected disassembly today was the last shreds of Musk's dignity because he's actually out there trying to like beg people to take blue checks now who are basically like, imagine if you had a fucking business where it was a virtue signal to not pay for it. Like if imagine my parking lots, if people were like, (laughs) you know what? The cool thing to do is park in Bill's fucking lot and break the gate and leave without paying. Like, like good, solid citizens, reporters, politicians were like, fuck Bill, don't pay to park there. Like, that's the business that he has made out of Twitter. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. And, and it gives me deep, profound joy to watch that piece of shit just slowly burning like the ember of a wasted joint dropped on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Oh, wow, Bill. The only thing that would have been better is if Diane Feinstein had been on that rock. Oh, True. Kevin Richburg. Wow. Hey, hey, did, hey, did I just do a rant? Did I just actually do a rant? Yes, indeed. You actually did do a rant, Bill, and it was really fun. It was off the cuff, and that was Thursday night's hangout. And now I got a little bit more because Kevin Richburg also had something to say. He's very fired up about the fact that. Diane Feinstein has not yet resigned, even though everybody seems to think she is not fully present. She's got a severe dementia, apparently, is the scuttlebutt. I, I don't know. I don't think anybody does for a fact, but these guys felt comfortable saying that. And so here's that part of the conversation from Thursday night. Well, OK, so, Kevin, you want to specifically... The issue with Diane Feinstein is pretty big, and, and you wanted to say something. It's, it, it's not big enough. It, it, okay. The, this is you can't mention that woman's name without me going into a, a deep, dark, horrible place. I there is no argument that has been made. There is no rationale that's been put forward by anyone. In fact, all the Democrats that are putting forth rationales just make me more angry. There is one thing for the to, for the good of her, for the good of everyone in California, for the good of all of us, for her to do. And it is to resign immediately. Craft of wonderful statement and go. There is no other answer. There are some Californians here, I believe, and I would like to get their opinion on that. But, you know, uh, Diane Feinstein is a champion of gay rights, Kevin. Don't care, because all I'm going to remember her for is bitch who who wouldn't go and was so selfish, so selfish that she wanted the end of her life to be all about her. That's and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's Sir RBG moment. I was just going to say that. Okay, yeah. All right, now we got a whole bunch of guys attacking legendary women. That- is it her or her staff because of her? Uh, her staff. Aaron nailed it. Aaron nailed it. Aaron nailed it. So yeah. I've literally been asking people the last couple of days, Kevin, by the way, how dare you, sir, be absolutely right about something? Oh, and, oh and, no. And no, you, it's totally right. I mean, it's crazy that she's still there. And, and, so, Aaron, the question that you just said, the thing you just said, I've actually been reaching out to friends on the Hill and saying, is it her staff or is it her? And you guys will all be interested to know that no one will give me an answer to that. It's her I'm staff. Then. It's I her staff. Exactly. Yeah, no that. answer is an answer. But yeah. I've heard about her issues is she is really fucking gone. Yes, she is. It, I don't want a senator like they're bad enough when they're got all their faculty. <laughs> this is <fun. laughs> okay. purposely holding up all those judge votes, right? Okay, so yeah. we all yes. we all agree on Diane Feinstein. Do any Californians want to get a vote on this that are here? It's your senator, and who should replace her? Uh, how's that going to work? And by the way, a black woman. You, <clears throat> period. Period uh, with a T. Did you say period? Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee is the black woman that seems to be run, but you got your Adam Schiff and your Katie Porter. You're not allowing for either of those, Ty. Pick a hat. Get a hat. Put names in a hat. 
Okay. Jeff, Better than what you I have love now. Katie Porter, oh, though. I, I do. I, oh, I like oh yeah, I do like Katie Porter. I, I would personally choose Katie Porter, but <clears throat> put him in a hat. Put him in a hat. If Diane uh, Feinstein resigns, you won't get Katie Porter or Adam Schiff. John, are you in California? I am. I'm in Joshua Tree. Uh, oh, yeah. What a tough really? life. Great to it's, see you, my friend. And what, pretty what, sweet. what are you saying? Why would you... Gavin Newsom has already come out and said that he would appoint um, an African-American woman. Barbara oh. Lee, of the three of them, is the only African-American woman in the running. And Look she's running her. last, by just, the way. Just, just to vote. That's all. That's Bring all. it on. Appoint Barbara Lee. Appoint I'm Barbara good. Bush. Appoint Barbara Bosser. Dude, appoint, appoint Robert Ely at this point. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's a bridge yeah. too far there, man. No, thank you. There you go. A little too far, Maddie. Maddie C., you heard from Ty in there. You heard from Aaron the Farmer. Of course, Bill Boyle. We had a great conversation the other night. Sounds like it was a bunch of guys having a conversation about uh, this female senator now, and I'm I'm listening to it back. We're, we're monsters. But we heard from a couple of women in that conversation as well, I think. But I'd love to hear from you in terms of who you'd like to see out there in California. You're a listener in California. Who do you want to be? Your next senator, if and when Diane Feinstein calls it quits or passes away or who knows what will happen there. But it's inevitable. And you've got several people whose names are running. And as we just mentioned and talked about, I would love to hear from you. All right. Well, that is all I've got for the first half of today's show. The second half is my conversation now with Mara Quint. But I do think that first half should win some kind of a podcast news coverage award. I thought that was pretty robust and well done, and I I spent a lot of time working on it. So hopefully you appreciated that. If you didn't and I wasted my time, email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com. All right, so Mara, of course, is the co-founder of Tax March. She is a contributor to The Onion because she's a very funny writer, McSweeney's, and more. She's on Twitter at Behind Your Back. She's on TikTok and Instagram as well. She is an influencer for sure. She's also employed at the Americans for Tax Freedom, rather Americans for Tax Fairness, where she runs their campaigns, americansfortaxfairness.org. And uh, we're always happy, happy when she joins me. We had a great conversation about Twitter, and I thought that was really important and interesting. Her insights on the blue check mark and whether or not anybody should pay for them. Talked a little bit about politics and a couple of other things and had several laughs, as always. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, Mara Quint. Welcome back. Good to see you. Hi. Hi, how's it going? Going pretty good. It's going, you know, like we're we're really doing a lot of good stuff and things are going well. How about you? Um, it's sure. Let's pretend that's the case here too. I like <laughs> yeah. that. Can I just make that be mine? Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, doing so much good stuff, man. Yeah. Oh, it's just it's just great. It's a lot of great. vagaries. Just This is fun. This is like it's like a helpful improv exercise. Like, oh, here's what you would say if you were doing really well. I'll just repeat your stuff. That sounds good. Really busy. A lot of been taking a lot of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, there's so much. I can't talk about any of it, but there's so much up and coming. I mean, you know, I don't uh, want to get into it now, but I have been the pipeline doing, so full. I, <laughs> your pipeline is full. My pipeline <laughs> has been filled with like Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. Why does this instantly sound sexy to me? Like, oh yeah, that is a that is a that pipeline is stuffed. I don't know. It just instantly. Maybe that explains half of where I am. Anyway, hi. HR, can we please? <laughs> I can't even mention a pipeline around this person. I just want to blow it up. What can I say? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we are off and I'm very happy to see you. Speaking of blowing it up, how about that for a segue? What I wanted to ask you, like I rarely come in with like very specific questions for you, but I definitely thought when I was thinking about talking, I was like, I want to ask Mara, where was she when she found out that Elon Musk's super rocket blew up this week? Oh gosh, that was fun. I don't even know, actually. I think I saw it in like near real time or right after uh it was it was lovely i mean but like did anyone think anything else that's all he's capable of doing is just exploding things whether it's a car a social media site or a rocket ship that's it that's his that's that's the skill this man has yeah just make it crash I mean, and burn. What, what does it say i mean you had a tweet about <laughs> how billionaires you know just just proves that they are uh more proof that they're stupid where is this tweet but, <laughs> but yeah well no it's it's more just that like we are fighting against this culture of belief that 
the wealthy have earned it because they're just so much better than the rest of us. They are smart. They are strong. They are powerful. They have insight. And Elon Musk does a great job every day of being like, no, 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 no. They're just lucky rich guys. Like that's, that's all they are. They do not have any special skill set. which is not to say that it's not possible to be rich and smart. Like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's possible, but we certainly need to divorce this idea that they're rich because they're so smart and capable. That is, that's not the case at all. That is a really good way of explaining it. Two things can kind of be the same, but you're not, you're not rich because you're smart. If you're rich, you probably, you know, you explain it. I don't need to redo it, but you, I, (laughs) Uh, The only good thing about Musk buying Twitter is how vigorously and consistently he destroys the myth that rich people are even vaguely talented, capable or intelligent. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that SpaceX has been a failure. I I don't know what it's been, but that launch was a spectacular failure in public. And so is what's happening to Twitter. And so is arguably, if you pay attention to the car markets, uh, what it looks like maybe happening to Tesla, too. Well, I mean, I think one of the key things that gets thrown out the window all the time with Musk is that he doesn't do any of these things. He just purchases them. He purchases these things that already exist. And then he just kind of takes a lot of credit and then muddles things up. And I certainly saw all of the defenders saying, no, 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 this was a this was a test launch. It's nobody expected it to take off at all. The fact that it took off was the big, uh, you know, positive thing. And maybe that is true. That if, if I'm a, a space engineer and that's what I'm doing, maybe I'm looking at it going, look, we this will be a success if it launches. But <laughs> Elon Musk did not engineer it. He doesn't get any credit for that. So the only thing he should have been doing is managing public perception of what is expected to happen. Like, that's it. And he failed at that. I mean, that's yeah. that's the same thing with Twitter. Like he he doesn't actually have to do the coding. He doesn't actually have to be the rocket scientist. He's not any of these things. He's bad at all of these things, but he does need to manage them. And he can't even do that. He's terrible at all of it. Well, can I just argue that he's over managing? Like he's not, he's making micro decisions that he shouldn't have anything to do with. And all of these decisions seem to be really bad and backfiring like immediately we've seen big companies roll out ad campaigns or even ads uh, or other products and be like Ee, that didn't go very well it happens but it seems like his micro decisions or, or these bigger decisions seem to be backfiring a lot and maybe he shouldn't be making so many decisions maybe he should hire good people what should he be doing right like what should he be doing what is he any good at as it turns out abandoning children. That seems to be the only thing that he's got any real skill at. Like just, just fathering and abandoning children. And, and that's about it. And then, I mean, like, it's funny because he's so transparently wants to be thought of as cool, like just so transparently. And he has nurtured the like biggest group of losers who will just be like, no, dude, you're cool. You're cool. We think it's hilarious when you say 420 and 69. Those are the funniest numbers. Oh, my God. He made them (laughs) up himself. Like, it's that level of sort of ridiculous stupidity. But in his heart, he knows that's not that's not what he wants. He wants the kids that he thinks are cool to think he's cool. And they never will. I hate that we have to think about or talk about, uh, these super wealthy people so much now more than than we used to, even though they've always obviously been influential because of Elon Musk, especially with Twitter. It's a it's a it's a it's a weird world we're living in. But speaking of which, um, how do you know, how do we talk about like what happened with the blue check thing? You're a big Twitter star and have been for a long time. And I, and I uh, frankly hope you never stop tweeting along with a handful of other people. I love to go and read their thoughts and what they're sharing and what they're resharing. It means a lot to me in my day. I, I learn a lot there. But with the blue check situation that occurred this week, basically, they finally removed blue checks from your name, from my name. And then there has become somewhat of a controversy as a result. Some people, uh, celebrities are keeping their blue checks because like, what do you, what happened? How do you explain what happened? And then I want to ask you the importance of it. It's it's really been utterly fascinating to watch in like uh, it's so many different levels of psychology happening all at once. And they are all oh, my God, it's like a field day. If I wish I was a sort of a sociological uh, 
academic and could just sit here and like write papers because it's well great. pretend you are because you're pretty good at it <laughs> yeah it's just call me doctor um if you want to lie down we'll talk about your mother um i don't know why i went into psychotherapy but i did anyway the point being so right blue checks existed on twitter to verify that this was really the person that they said it was and blue checks were just sort of given out willy-nilly there was no real system or process for it for a brief period of time there was there was this momentary period of time where you could apply to get a blue check you had to give a reason why you needed one that's how i got mine and i got it because at the time i was uh, doing more like journalism writing and so I said, hey, I'm reaching out to people for quotes. And so I just want them to know that it's me reaching out instead of somebody impersonating me. I don't want someone to be, you know, like tricked into saying something to a person who's not legitimate, which was it. And then I had to, you know, I had to show my ID and, and I got a blue check. So I didn't get a blue check because I was like, so cool. Like, wow, they were just like, this girl's awesome. Yeah, I did. It was just, yeah, you did. That, that's different. You're cooler than I am. We know that. But there was this brief period of time and that was fine. But then Twitter, you know, they were never very good with processes and they changed it all up again. And, you know, and, and newsrooms could purchase them and like there were various ways. But so you had these blue checks. Elon came in with this whole like this whole dissenting anger towards blue checks. There was this feeling that it was a caste system that you know, that special people had them and, and nobody got to choose. And there were so many right wingers in particular who had this tremendous grievance at the blue check elite. Now, there were lots of people doing similar things to me with much bigger accounts who did not have checks at all, like and who were doing just fine. They were they were doing great. It was not a problem, but it was the right that really cultivated because the right loves grievance. They love othering they love having groups to hate. They love all those things. So they, they really, oh gosh, these elites, these liberal, these liberal elites. Okay. So I think for a period of time, everyone was kind of on board with like, well, look, if you want to open the verification process up and have it just be, this is a real person. They've shown their ID. They, they, you, they have been checked by someone at Twitter that we know this is a person and not a bot. They are who they say they are. You get a blue check. Pretty much everyone was okay with that and on board with that. That didn't upset or anger anyone, but that wasn't enough. And Elon went with this whole, no, no, we're going to charge. We're going to charge because this is a special thing and you have to pay. Well, in his, just in his tiny defense, he came in looking for ways for Twitter to make money and having to pay for the blue check is one way to raise revenue, right? It, I mean, is it? It doesn't seem to be. Oh, no, no. It, it Clearly, it hasn't. It, it, to be fair, I read something. I don't know if this is right, but like the, the Slack, internal yeah. Slack at Twitter, somebody said that Elon is losing his mind because they literally only have 400 people who have paid. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but but it's apparently like minuscule number. So it's, it hasn't worked, but he was looking for ways to get people to pay. This was one of the yeah, ways. This goes back to what is he any good for? Because it was very clear immediately that paying for a blue check was not something that was going to be very appealing because what you're right. doing is taking the people who are creating the content and your site is simply an amalgam of content and you're taking the people who are doing the work and saying, now you have to pay for the privilege of doing the work so I can make money. And that doesn't make sense as a business model. Most people are going to go, yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to pay for the privilege of getting to work for you. That do, that's not, that does not work. We got rid of that system a long time ago. Unfortunately, they're trying to bring it back, but like, that's not something that is appealing. Now, if however, what you're saying is here's a host of services that you can like level up and pay for. Here's a bunch of extra things you can get. There were lots of people saying, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. If I could have these extra sort of things and there were lots of them and there were enough that were appealing, sure, I would pay for additional services. But of course that's not how Elon did it. He sold it as uh, you have to pay for the privilege of being here. And if you don't, I'm going to deplatform your information. You're going to have less, you're not going to be able to be as searched. You're going to sort of fall down in the algorithm. And then proceeded to join in with all the right wingers and their grievances and mock all of the people that they wanted to pay, making it instantly distasteful. No one was like, what now I'm going to cave to you trying to like 
call me a jerk or an ass? Like, no, of course not. Why would I give you money for that? And it, he just instantly created a product that was already unappealing, that didn't make fiscal sense, and then absolutely went to town trying to like bully the people that he wanted to purchase his product. So within like 24 hours, made it completely toxic. So toxic that people were like eager to not have a blue check. Right. And then, and this was what was wonderful. I was out all day yesterday. I came in and saw all of this at the end of the day. I think what happened is Elon realized that he had completely devalued the product. So he's now trying to make it suddenly more powerful again. And he took all of the accounts with over a million followers and gave them a blue check. But now what you have is a group of people who have the largest followings on your platform outright doing things to try and get rid of the check, like trying to shake off the mark of the devil from their thing. So you, you're you trying to convince people to pay money for this while these high influencers are now being forced to outright say, holy shit, never in a million years would I be such a loser as to pay for this. Right, right. You have now effectively created a massive campaign of high visibility individuals talking about how your product that you're trying to sell is the worst thing that they can possibly imagine and they would never be caught dead except that that's just it. He's given the blue check to a bunch of dead people and they now have badges on individuals, celebrities who have passed. Yeah. Their pages say, oh, they've, they're paying for Twitter blue. When of course they're not, they're dead. They're not paying for Norma anything. Norma Donald, Chadwick Maybe Boseman. Hell, but like not on this earth. So it's a ridiculous system and kind of hilarious to watch. And it's fascinating to see all of the like machinations, these emotional sort of, uh, jungle gyms that these people are running through trying to justify each of Elon's actions in real time. And they're contradictory, but they don't mind. They're just like, they, I've never been in a yoga class where I saw people more flexible. They are just like, who are the absolutely. people that are his supporters, his followers, his fans or. Yeah. 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 The, who the, are the those people? Who, who are, is there any way to categorize those who support Elon? Musk? I mean, I'm sure they lean right. In, in politically, and they're probably Even overwhelmingly male. Many hundred of them in the last like 24 hours. Uh, I would say libertarian is a big one. They love, there's a lot of libertarian in there. Libertarian or conservative, it is, it's, it's the same group as the, the Trumpies, really. Um, it, what about like somebody, it was this woman, do you know this woman, politics girl? She's a very big deal. She <laughs> no, is a liberal like content creator who just makes videos in her kitchen and she's got them. She's making a fortune is my understanding. And she, I tweeted somebody, Alison Gill, who said something about the blue check would never pay. And then she replied. And now I've been getting all her people like <laughs> b basically her rep reply was, I have to pay for it or else I can't make and post my videos. Oh, are they not letting people post videos? I'm not sure, it? but my point is, like, for for like my biggest concern is Twitter has been the best place to market this program, uh, and like the idea that I can't market it or that uh, I'm being yeah. limited is really disconcerting. Uh, it being one of the primary ways, if you can't post your videos or your content without the blue check, I can justify getting the blue check for her and maybe me and others. I don't know, like if. It's no sense if I can't post the, the stuff I'm doing, I guess. I mean, I understand your argument totally, but what are we it, supposed to do? No, no, I understand that. I know that there are people in between a rock and a hard place, but I would see this honestly as like the, the warning sign because people are still like the people you want are still abandoning Twitter in droves. And so I like, and the, I, I would, I would not purchase even to, to uh, like, if you needed to, to promote things, I would not purchase anything right now. I would absolutely hold off. That would be the advice that I would give because one of two things is going to happen. And this is the other fun thing. Elon is just an egomaniacal moron. So he doesn't plan anything. He doesn't think through any decision whatsoever. He just decides on a whim, like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if, oh, here's the, I think that this is, 
or, you know, cat turd two or some other right wing crazy, you know, idiot. Like it's like, you should do this. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 let's do that. Cause I'm not even smart enough to think up stupid things. So yeah, 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 we'll do that. So all of this like is just completely in flux right now. Elon, I mean, like the decision to, to take checks away, to give checks back, to do it to these, to did not do, they're happening literally at a, at a, a whim. And so I think like wait through all of this and see what happens for now. And that might mean a slight lesser right. hit, but I don't even know if that's true. I think that there's going to be other ways to do things or Twitter is just going to be in this like unpleasant volatile state for so long. It's just going to continue to bleed people that you actually want to see it. So I would not stain myself with the paying of, uh, of Musk right now. And either it will balance itself out somehow in the long run and it will, he'll, you know, there'll be somebody will step in and go, Hey, here's a way that this makes sense for people to do and blah, blah, blah. And then at that point, you know, if, if it makes sense business wise, okay. But right now it's just, it's, it just doesn't the like loss of your, uh, goodwill of, of individuals that you want to be, um, you know, finding and following your stuff. Yeah. Is, is not worth it at all. Are I you, think you're going to suffer more than gain from paying. I appreciate all of that analysis and trust your opinion a lot, obviously. Um, have you found any success or that that's in any way similar on TikTok or Instagram or any of the other social media networks that you're kind of enjoying at all? I mean, you don't seem like I've you're... I've never tried uh, to, like, build. I know that people, you know, a lot of people have... have you know, transitioned from, especially from Twitter to Instagram, because Instagram has stuff set up for creators to like really encourage, but Instagram is really limited in terms of what you can, the click throughs and the, the finding. And, um, I've never once tried to build an audience there. Mm. Um, and the only reason I'm on Instagram at all. And the only reason I post, I post my old tweets on Instagram fairly regularly. The only reason I do that is because so many, um, of these like large accounts put, take my tweets anyway and post them on Instagram and get massive, massive responses. Oh. And so they're monetizing my content and that's it. Like, I know it's kind of goofy that I do that, but I do it as sort of a little like, all right, Hey, if, if you like it so much and you're, you're giving money to these other people, you can just follow me here. How do I monet- put all the content in one place? How do I monetize <laughs> your content? I'll, I'll go for that. <laughs> Haven't you been trying to, it just doesn't work very well. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people want to, and uh, no one's figured it out. Well, I have me, but... actually having you here, but uh, <laughs> so to be fair, but it's a, it's a completely different format, obviously, uh, than than social media. So I want to ask... want to monetize me. Okay, trust me, I'm right there with you. I want to pimp out all of your talents is the, and make money off of it. That's basically my entire. <laughs> I know, you hit on the problem right there. Talents. I forgot to get those. Uh, Once stop I get it. those, it's going to be a lot easier. Stop it, you. Mm -hmm. So speaking of talent, Joe Biden is going to announce that he's running again this week. Any thoughts on the, the, the rematch Biden Trump do to we just not, (laughs) can we just not do this? Like, can't we not do it? We did it. We did it. We didn't, none of us liked it. No one liked it. No one was happy, but we did it. So like, let's just, let's just not, I, that's my big political analysis. No. That is great. I can't wait to see you on CBS <laughs> Face the Nation with that commentary. Does MSNBC need someone else? Can we I, just I've, not? I've got a lot of the, no to say. Are I there think. any other questions or topics <laughs> besides the fact that these two old men are going to face off again? One of I them. Mean, that's just it, right? Like, it's two old men. We know who they are. At this point, I don't even think there's that many people excited about either on either side. Like, I think even Trump has lost a lot of his glow, even from his absolute, you know. Can I? From- I want to answer one thing that I think is interesting to talk about regarding this race, and you can shit on it or not. But in every, and I've covered, I don't know how many, three presidential elections, like, It's always a very similar thing in that anything can happen during a campaign. News can break. You can find out something 
about mm-hmm. a candidate. You know, I mean, Howard Dean screamed he got canned and Barack Obama's, you know, uh, pastor. Uh, created, you know, you never know the October sure. surprise idea. The October surprise. But, but I think what's interesting is that we're pretty sure it's highly likely that over the next year, Donald Trump is going to be in increasingly dramatic, serious legal Trouble may be indicted by several different courts. And in particular, this week, they're kicking off the E. Jean Carroll rape case, apparently, or a defamation case. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's that's going to be a really uh, terrible PR for him. And I wonder if these surprises that normally happen and most likely are going to happen and they're the worst kind. It's Indictment after indictment, if that's a real game changer for this presidential It changes campaign. nothing. Okay. It changes nothing. All right. There is no one in this country, I, I do not believe there is anyone in this country who has voted before in our elections who does not know which side of the Joe Biden, Donald Trump divide they are on. And mm. I mean, okay, obviously I'm wrong. There are definitely 10 people and CNN is going to find them and put them but, in a room. But, like, but, it, but can that's it be? It. Can it be less about, I'm sorry if you don't want to do this, but I'm doing it. No, no, no. Can it be, I'm sorry, you know, I know you don't want to, but listen, <laughs> still, that can it be not that you don't, you're on the fence with one of those two. It can be specifically people are motivated and have been motivated to support Donald Trump, lose that motivation even a little to the point then, there's, you know, I'm not voting for this guy. I'm not going to come out and vote for him. He's not going to well, win. Look, this is definitely, I mean, I think if, if anything is going to define what this election is, it is absolutely going to be motivation to get to the polls. And that that's all it's going to come down to. And unfortunately, I do not think that either side is particularly electrifying. I do not think that there is a, a person out there who's going to be like, nah, 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 this is, this is it. This is the, per- I got to, I got to fucking take time off work so I can get out and possibly get whatever the new COVID is. And uh, this, this really matters. I think you have two people. I mean, obviously I do not think that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are the same in any way at all. I'm simply saying in terms of the amount of enthusiasm that they are generating, I don't think that it is like huge shock waves of support that are going to bring out this whole new group of voters <laughs> Joe, are really motivated. I, I think that's most evidenced by the fact that apparently I just heard this. I don't know if it's true. The Joe Biden's uh, announcement is going to be a video, a video, because no one's going to like there's not going to be a huge crowd of people. And even if there were, they're not going to be all excited the way they were. People, Americans have been and people have been for political candidates across the spectrum around across history. No, this is going to be a real ugly election cycle is my sort of guess. My prediction is it's going to be incredibly ugly because it is going to be based on getting people to the polls. And because you're not going to see a lot of people excited, what it's going to be is a defensive getting people to polls, right? You don't want that guy. And so the only way to do that is by being increasingly, increasingly demonizing and aggressive and like, the, you know, and you get more of that apocalyptic threat of, you know, this guy is going to blow up the earth. We have to stop him. And I, I think that that's what we're going to see a lot of. And of course, the Republicans are much better at that. They are very good at demonizing and driving people through hate, which is worrying because the groups that Trump is going I and mean, his, his rhetoric has been getting more increasingly unhinged more increase. I mean, like who thought that that could even be a statement because, you know, what room did he have to grow into? But, uh, you know, the universe (laughs) is vast and expanding. Like it's unbelievable. And I, I'm, it's worrying because the amount of vitriol that he's going to need to gin up to get his people to say, yeah, uh, Joe Biden's coming for, you know, your, your children and your right to have a cookie. Like, I don't, I don't know what it is they care about, but you know, they are going to have to really go all out with the hatred. And uh, and that's going to wind up really dangerous, not for either of them, but for whole swaths of the population that are vulnerable. And so it's it's worrying. All right. I'll let you go. But I do have to ask you, because I, I know uh, you privately told me you've been stockpiling mifepristone pills to sell at a high uh, rate <laughs> just to make a little extra cash. Uh <laughs> What are your thoughts about the Supreme Court's decision? I don't know how closely you're paying attention to it, but apparently it's going to be there for a a few more weeks, uh, at least. That pill is going to be available. But I guess maybe the question is about they they outlawed abortion, they overturn abortion in in red states, state after state. And and then some push push for a national ban, Lindsey Graham and others. 
Uh, and now then the next thing is the abortion pill where most women terminate their pregnancy using these pills, apparently. So, you know, they're continuing to, to do everything they can, arguably alienating a huge percentage of Americans. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on the status of the fight over the pill, much less reproductive rights right now? And do you have any extra pills that you want to sell to listeners? <laughs> well, first of all, no, I do not have. Uh, I'm not been stockpiling. I have. I laughed when you said that because I was like, wait, did I tell Pete about my week? Uh, which is a whole separate thing. How it's many not, mifepristones did you take this it's week? It's not mifepristone. <laughs> it, it's, you know, our, oh gosh, it's such a long story. I'm going to try and make it real short. Our healthcare system is entirely broken. I am a very fortunate person who gets this little uh, FSA where I get like a certain amount of my paycheck gets taken out and put into this like oh, you have, you have certain amount of money for healthcare stuff for the year and you, you can use that for co-pays and things. But I, uh, <laughs> I, I haven't been able to go to any of the doctors that I've wanted to go to because there's none near me that are taking clients for the next two years. So I haven't had a lot of co-pays this year. And this money that they take out of my paycheck, it expires if I don't spend it within the year. So I was facing down. I have two weeks to go. I have this money that is mine that I need to spend so you can go into these FSA stores and buy like healthcare products. So I oh, bought, you know, okay. These are flexible spending account is FSA, yes. by the way. Yeah. So oh. I bought all the like children. I bought so much. I bought more sunscreen than you ever need. I bought all of like, you know, cold and flu medicines. I have a friend who is expecting, I bought her prenatal gummies and baby stuff and, you know, like anything that I could do to, cause I, I didn't, I don't want to waste or lose this money, right. but then I needed to spend a large chunk of it. And I realized that they were selling Plan B, <laughs> the morning after pill, which is not cheap. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, well, you know, people need these and they're often out of stock. <laughs> so you did, in fact, do what I jokingly said you did. So if anybody needs any, I'm not selling them, but you just let me know and I will get you a plan B. But I mean, I, I hope you live really close because you got to use those within 72 hours. So, yeah. So I laughed because oh. I was like, how did you know? Yeah, that happened. I And I forgot. Because I did this late at night. I think I'd had a drink. I was crazy. like, oh, I got to spend this money. Ah, and then ah. this giant box came the other day. And I was like, what did I order? And I opened it up and just started laughing hysterically. Because just like the boxes came spilling out. So That is a hilarious story. And <laughs> also an interesting look into FSAs and people. The whole, the whole thing um, is awful. All right, any, any, any thoughts at all about the, the news regarding? It's terrifying. It's, it's really upsetting. It's really upsetting. I wish it were a standalone thing and we could all fight against it. Unfortunately, it is just part of this onslaught to, uh, to fully control and like really to bring this Christian fascism as a ruling power in the country. And that has been going on for years and they are just getting stronger. And it is, it, it's pretty terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's where it comes down to for me. I mean, I'm obviously very worried about just that, just the, the right. But I'm I'm worried in a more broader sense across the board because none of these are isolated fights. They are all one big umbrella fight. And it's it's a lot. It's a lot that we're facing. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. I know you have to go mow your lawn. Uh, much appreciated. Unless somebody wants to do that. I'll do it in exchange for a morning after pill. <laughs> Mark Winter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go, Mara Quint. Thank you very much, my friend. Great to have her, as always, almost always on Mondays. Thank you for listening to today's show. I've got a great week of guests, a full week of guests planned. I'd love to let you know, let you have you. I'd love to. What I'm trying to say is if you want to hear anybody on the show, email me, standupapete at gmail.com. If you want to be a guest on the show, uh, pitch me yourself as well. That's all I've got for today. Thanks to Pete Coe and John Carroll, who are my announcer and music talent here on the show. Go support both of them. And that's all I've got, except for this quite inspiring quote, which is something I try to end each and every day's show on. Success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it. Maya Angelou said that. Thanks, Maya Angelou. Talk to you tomorrow, folks. Oh, you
blood down off of your fence. Even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up you got to stand up oh, come on just stand up everybody got to stand up in the darkest hour stand up people got the power stand up come on come on come on come on come on Come on, come on, come on, stand up.